Good morning. Thank you for your attention. Thank you for being here for today's presentation. As always, please remember to silence your cell phones and put them away. Here to introduce today's presenter is George Luger. Good morning. My name is George Luger, and I'm honored to have the privilege of introducing my good friend, Sally Terrell, today. It's only fitting that Sally's doing her senior speech on Valentine's Day because Sally has a passion for learning and a true love of science. In addition, Sally has a huge heart and has taught me a lot about positivity, kindness, and the importance of being welcoming and accepting of everyone. Here's Sally to talk to us this morning about the reality behind non neutronian fluids. Have you ever wondered why it's so hard to get shampoo out of the bottle? Or maybe you're curious about what makes fun fun or why we like to behave the way it does. I was curious about these phenomena and thought it'd be interesting to study them. That is how I discovered rheology, a branch of physics that, quote, attempts to define a relationship between the stress acting on a given material and the resulting deformation and or flow that takes place, end quote. It isn't studied in most high school physics classes or even most graduate level ones. It's a very specialized branch, so I started from square one, and I had a hard time finding many beginner articles focusing on rheology. A lot of my time was spent trying to learn what on earth these equations mean. First, we need to define a non Newtonian fluid. Quote Newtonian fluids are defined as those exhibiting a direct proportionality relationship between shear stress and shear rate, whereas for non Newtonian fluids, the relationship between shear stress and shear rate is not linear. End quote. Newtonian fluids flow at a rate that is directly proportional to the apparent force on them. While that sounds complicated, it really means that fluids flow faster when you push harder and flow slower when you push later. While their flow rate is dependent on stress, their viscosity is constant. The viscosity of Newtonian fluids does not change, which is a really important concept. Non-Newtonian fluids are any fluid that does not follow these rules. Some common examples of non-Newtonian fluids include ketchup, gooblet, Nail polish, many paints, whipped cream, peanut butter, and French drink. The first major thing I learned was that there are different types of non newtonian fluids. They fit into one of four main categories of, of non newtonian fluids shear thinning, pseudoplastic, shear thickening, dilatant, thixotropic, and rheopectic. Shear stress is created when two layers slip past each other. A viscous fluid is one that requires pressure to continue flowing. That pressure can be the pressure from gravity. In pseudoplastic fluids, increasing the shear stress on the fluid decreases the viscosity. These fluids are fluids that flow faster when more shear stress is applied to them. These pseudoplastic fluids are called shear thinning fluids, and some examples of them are ketchup and nail polish. For dilatant fluids, increased stress increases viscosity. This means that increasing stress, shear stress decreases flow rate. Dilatant fluids are commonly called shear thickening since they become thicker the more stress is applied to them. Some examples of dilatin fluids are oobleck and quicksand. The two other main categories of non newtonian fluids are thixotropic and rheopectic. These fluids both have viscosities that change with stress, however, their viscosities change based on the amount of time they are under stress. For thixotropic fluids, the longer shear stress is applied, the lower the viscosity become. That means the longer the force is applied to the thixotropic fluid, the faster it will flow. Some examples of thixotropic fluids are peanut butter, glue, yogurt, and some paints. Rheopectic fluids are the opposite of that. The longer shear stress is applied, the thicker they become. Some examples of rheopectic fluids include gypsum paste and printer ink. Being able to understand rheology has a lot of practical applications. In business, it is necessary to have someone with a firm understanding of rheology so that you can package things in the most effective ways possible. For example, if you're trying to jam a gelatin fluid into a package with a bunch of force, then your packaging process will be very slow and infuriating. <laughs> However, if you think about how gelatin fluids work, you will remember that applying less force will in fact make it easier to package a fluid such as quicksand. But if you are working with a pseudoplastic fluid, you want to apply pressure to make sure it is a faster packaging process. Pseudoplastic fluids will flow much slower without force than neutronium fluids, so you have to apply extra force if you want something like catch up to the package fast enough. Testing viscosity can be very useful for quality control measures. 
And comparing the viscosities of different brands helps determine differences in how consumers will experience them. If one fluid has a lot higher viscosity, it will move faster. So high, low viscosity lotions might feel cheap to the touch and become more watery. But if viscosity is too high, they will seem dried out and be hard to use. Some creams need to have a high viscosity, so then you need to focus on other characteristics of the fluid to test them. Even in chemical manufacturing, testing viscosities can be important. Testing these non newtonian properties shows if the formulas are consistent or if there are irregularities and batches. It makes it easier to test large volumes of fluid, so you can just test a small sample for each batch as long as everything's thoroughly mixed. This shows an important use of rheology is quality control. Testing the properties of different batches can help determine if there are any irregularities. If the viscosity varies a lot in different batches, you know something went wrong. There are a couple of companies that work to test these fluids. One such company is the Center for Industrial Rheology. They focus solely on rheology, but there are other labs that use these principles to design product, like D3O, a company that specializes in making helmets using diluted fluids. All of these examples show that there are practical applications for rheology. Knowing these applications, I hope you're a little more interested in the science behind it. So without further ado, let's begin discussing my experimentation. Since rheology is a very complicated physics, branch of physics that neither I nor any of the faculty had a background in, I had to start from square zero. I learned a new branch of physics for this topic, and as a result, my experiment wasn't very complicated. But as my understanding of calculus becomes more firm, I will be able to understand rheology even more. For now, however, I have to use much less generally used equations for calculating viscosity. Since I was unable to use the complicated equations, I had to design my experiment from scratch. There are a lot of fancy tools that can calculate the viscosity quickly, but sadly, these were out of my budget. Rheology needs more expensive equipment and tools in order to be studied effectively and efficiently. The first viscometer that I tried to make was a falling ball viscometer. Usually, it is set up in a long tube held at a slight angle so the ball rolls down the side of the tube. You record the ball and calculate how long it takes for it to reach terminal velocity. The main problem with this method is that you need to be able to see the ball, and the fluids I was testing were not transparent. I tried adding string to the steel ball and setting up a meter stick to record how fast the string moved, but that did not end up working. The other problem was that my graduated cylinder was not long enough for the ball to reach terminal velocity. I could have ordered a taller graduated cylinder, but there were so many issues with this method that it didn't seem like a good investment. Another common method of calculating viscosity is the cup core method. It utilizes a cup with a set volume attached to a rod. There's a hole in the bottom for the liquid to throw flow through. Recording the time it takes for the flow of fluid to stop flowing can help to test the viscosities. While I was in the process of trying to order one of these cups, I came up with a new idea. In the cup method, you need to hold some, you need something to hold a set volume of liquid as it flows out of the cup and something to record the flow rate. I reasoned that if I bought a funnel, I could set the I could stop the end and pour a set amount of liquid into it. Then releasing the stopper in a quick motion, I could record how long it took to flow out. To increase the data I got from each trial, I poured it into a 500 milliliter graduated cylinder. Recording the graduated cylinder allowed me to get flow rate per second. Theoretically, I should also be able to get the change in flow rate from this. In reality, that turned out to be a lot more difficult than I thought, but more on that later. I bought a funnel meant for filling oil in cars, and it needed to be a big size funnel since it would need to hold 250 milliliters of each fluid. The next thing I needed to figure out was how to stop the end of the funnel. First, I tried holding a piece of cardboard over the opening to create a seal. Stupidly, I used a glue pipe for the first trial. I learned very quickly not to do that again because cardboard did not create a seal, and I spilled it all over myself and the physics lab. So now I know that my cardboard, that, and I tried to hold it with my hand, and that didn't work either. So now I know that cardboard and my hand wouldn't work to stop the end. Next, I tried using a cup to hold the fluids. I cut down the sides of the cup to make it easier to take up off. The cup did not hold and spilled wall of water all over me. Next, I tried a piece of wood, which I should have realized wouldn't work in the failed cardboard attempt, but I didn't think about that. And even more water was spilled. I was about to give up on this entire method when I remembered the parafilm system. Parafilm is usually used in chem labs to create an airtight seal around something, which helps in reactions or to keep the material from evaporating or to avoid introducing air into a reaction. I figured if it could form an airtight seal good enough for chemists, it might work for me. My only concern was that it wouldn't be able to hold the weight of some of these more dense fluids. Shockingly, it did hold the weight as long as it didn't leave it in for too long. I learned that the hard way with ketchup, which is not a fun lesson to learn. 
One of the main challenges of using hair foam was removing it in a swift motion. I kept halfway removing it and water would spray all over me. The amount of paper towels I had to use during this experiment was incredible. Eventually, I got the hang of removing the parafilm and I learned how to wrap it in a way to make it easier to remove. Another good thing was that I learned how to use a smaller piece of parafilm so I didn't go through it as much. Because while parafilm was the perfect solution, it is expensive. So now I had a good method of measuring viscosity and a way to conduct it. I just needed to carry out the experiment. It was a really frustrating process because while the parafilm worked, it was really difficult to use. I had to run around the lab in order to clean the graduate cylinder before the parafilm lost its grip and all the fluid would pour out. I selected a couple of fluids to compare to each other. The blood turned out to be extremely messy, which made the experiment a little more difficult. But the worst thing to test was ketchup. It was really strong smelling, and the music funnel still smells like ketchup to this day. The fluids I selected were water to act as control, ketchup, bootleg, shampoo, and hair conditioner. Ketchup is a classical example of a pseudoplastic fluid. Bootleg is a good example of a gelatine fluid. Shampoo and conditioner are my wild cards. I predicted that they would be pseudoplastic fluids. I use water as my control group since it is a Newtonian fluid whose properties are the same, even with slight variations in the environment. <coughs> While it doesn't make a huge difference, it does make a slight difference to the viscosity of the fluid, which brand of each product you use. So I use the least expensive of each other product. The ketchup brand is great value ketchup, and the shampoo and conditioner were both swab, and the different scents shouldn't make a calculable difference. To make the oobleck, I combined two parts water with three parts cornstarch, and I hope to grab clear differences in each type of fluid. For each trial, I used 250 milliliters. After covering the top of the funnel with parafilm, I would add the fluid into it. To make the experiment easier, I etched a line in the funnel exactly where it's 250 milliliters full. This decreased the accuracy of my experiment a little, but it should not greatly affect the results. I set up the funnel on a ring stand positioned above a 500 milliliter graduated cylinder with a background behind it to make sure I was able to accurately see the flow of the fluid. I had lines of Sharpie spaced every 50 milliliters to make it easier to read the measurements. I set up my phone using another ring stand to film the fluid as it filled up the beaker in slow motion. I started the recording, then removed the parafilm in a clean movement so as not to disturb the fluid. First, I found the flow rate of each fluid. I predicted the water would have the highest flow rate, followed by shampoo, then oobleck, then conditioner, and ketchup. Water had the highest average flow rate with 212.6 milliliters per second. Second highest flow rate was the conditioner with 31.4 milliliters per second. As you can tell, this went against my hypothesis. Next was oobleck with 18.0 milliliters per second. Then it was ketchup with 13.2 milliliters per second. And lastly, surprisingly, was shampoo with 12.9. As you can tell, this is not what I predicted. The next step was to find the viscosities of the fluids. The relationship between the viscosities is inversely proportional to the relationship between flow rates. This equation is a consequence of the hagen purcell equation. I decided that water was the best one to compare the viscosities to. So each viscosity I find will be the viscosity relative to the viscosity of water. I thought the ketchup, shampoo, and conditioner would have similar viscosities, but they would like having a slightly lower viscosity. Surprisingly, this was not the case. The relative viscosity of water was, of course, one. Conditioner had the next lowest relative viscosity with a value of 6.8. Then it was oobleck with 11.8, and then surprisingly, ketchup and shampoo had very similar values of 16.1 and 16.5, respectively. It was really surprising to me how low the viscosity of conditioner was, especially since I've always had a harder time getting conditioner out of a bottle than shampoo. Mm -hmm. From this, I can infer that shampoo and ketchup most likely have very similar rheological properties, leading me to believe that shampoo is a pseudoplastic fluid. Conditioner is, however, is most likely a Newtonian fluid with a higher viscosity. In order to further investigate the non-Newtonian properties of these fluids, we would have to continue experimenting with different pressures. Next step to determine the actual non newtonian properties would be to add different weights on top of the fluid and see how they flow with different amounts of force. I thought I would derive these values without adding the weights. The time measurements I took were not accurate enough to check these properties, and it would have taken much more calculus and physics knowledge than I have. Without being able to derive these values, I would need to continue experimenting. And to do so, I would change to using a Buckner funnel. They are much, much larger, so I would be able to let it run for longer. Then I would cut out a cardboard or wooden circle that is the diameter of the funnel. Even the spacing weights around the circle would have allowed me to apply more force to it without buying any expensive machinery. Then I would run three trials each at different weight levels. Water should increase speed linearly according to the increase in force. 
catch up, she moves slowly until after a certain force threshold and then move much faster. Ooh, actually moved the fastest with no wings. My hypothesis was that she had no condition and would be pseudoplastic fluids, so they would behave similarly to catch up and move slowly until after a certain force threshold. To make my experiment more accurate, I could have added another fluid that has a lower viscosity. Comparing multiple fluids with such high viscosity is good, but to eliminate any potential bias, adding another fluid would have helped a lot. It is also important to show that some fluids with low viscosities are non Newtonian. Most non Newtonian fluids are very viscous, but there are some of us viscosity non Newtonian fluids, like nail polish. I also should have used a larger funnel. If I had used a black neck funnel, I would have been able to add weights on top much more easily. And I would have been able to add more fluid to get more accurate timings. In a perfect world, I also would have gotten a faster camera since the frames of my camera weren't quite accurate enough to portray timings. And a better camera would have clearer images, which would have made it much easier to determine how full the graduated cylinder was. Another good idea would have been to partner up with a programmer who could make an algorithm to determine the change in flow rate over time. Had I been able to do that, I would have been able to get some really pretty graphs. Having those graphs would be able to further prove which type of non Newtonian fluid shampoo and conditioner are. There are many different tools and variables that need to be taken into account, and every fluid behaves slightly differently. Much is still unknown about these fluids. For example, not much is understood about ketchup. Ketchup has a hard time flowing out of bottles, but it's not known if it's because the particles are too big and have a hard time flowing past each other or something else is the cause. This air of mystery is what caused me to be interested in this topic. It's also what makes my experimentation relevant to the scientific community as a whole. Throughout this process, I learned a lot. I learned how to design experiments and how to read scientific journals. There was a lot of complicated math and even more trial and error. I had to come up with a lot of new ideas on my own and spent hours trying to figure out if something would theoretically work. And it was a lot of learning. I still don't understand a lot of rheology, and don't worry, the fancy words confuse me too. <laughs> the most important thing to do was learning that I can actually figure this out. I know that I want to pursue STEM, and doing this proved to me that I have the skills needed to do that. I do not, however, want to study rheology in college. It turns out I really don't love this range of physics. <laughs> all in all, I really enjoyed experimenting, and it taught me a lot about my skills, and it taught me I can do a lot more than I thought I could. Thank you. So you know there's a lot of you know the torch really, I'm not totally close up. So uh,